Hey folks, this video is about my song uh, Dear Resonance with Even and Blackouts. Uh, right now, you're going to hear the full song. There's actually no visuals uh, for it. But if you know the song, you can just pass over the two and whatever minutes this song is long and then get to the heart of the matter. Um, but if not, and if you've never heard the song, uh, please enjoy it because then you'll learn all about it in a few minutes. Thank you. come up with different things to fill the gap I have right now of missing reading my book Weasels in a Box. Um, I'm also sort of looking through my life and trying to come up with things that aren't just superfluous but might be important to say, um, but also at the same time trying to want to push my art. And sometimes those are in, in conflict uh, because the things I want to push about myself, I might just want to push because I'm trying to keep myself out there. 
trying to keep, you know, my presence relevant in the world. As you know, as 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 we all are sort of experiencing, the older we get, and because of the digital age, the more generations used to be ten years. I think generations now are year by year. Um, so it's I don't know. It's sort of an ego driven thing to be try to f- still want to feel relevant in some way. Um. So what I'm doing here is exploring my song, which I think is one of the best songs I've written for Even in Blackouts, which is called Dear Resonance. Uh, a little background, it was from the second record called Zeitgeist's Echo, which basically means, oh, that that's a whole nother thing in itself. Zeitgeist Echo, uh, to me, I always like the word Zeitgeist. And there was a band out of, I think, New Jersey called Zeitgeist that I like. Um, that's how I also discovered the Feelies and a bunch of, uh, they would call garage bands in the day. In the 80s, they would call them uh, sort of garage band rock. Um, alternative, maybe at the time. Uh, so I looked up the word when I heard it there, and it means basically the literal translation is time ghost. Because um, it's German, you know, Zeit uh, is time and geist uh is ghost but it's also uh means mind and uh in the times of the in the 1700s um there was a man named uh Johann Gottfried Herder who used the word uh maybe I think for the first time and he was referring to it as genius uh which relates to this idea of the spirit of the times where um, he believed that a genius or in who someone who was very good at their art or whatever field they were in were actually in touch with their generation were in touch with what's going on in the world right now and so my my term zeitgeist echo was sort of a comment on that I feel most everyone and myself in general are living in the echo of the spirit of the times which means we are affected more by pop culture and we think we are being of this generation but really we are hearkening back to um, I don't know things that are more safe to deal with or to talk about so that we're not out there on the limb all the time as we speak or create art Um, so it was sort of a call to myself to try to as much I could stay in the moment instead of looking at whatever is popular and imitating that. So that was the idea at Zeitgeist Echo. And I was hoping with the band, uh, even in Blackouts, that I was trying to do something different for me. It was mistaken for people thinking that I was trying to do something that's different in music altogether, which I think is almost impossible. Uh, Not that everything has been done. I think everyone who... Uh, brings their own self to their talent is going to create something unique um, but it's difficult and that's like I said that was sort of a constant reminder to me by naming the title that that the idea was to try to be in the moment and not to live in the past uh, with what I was creating so it's from that record <laughs> which was our second record and is probably the most bizarre record I really went into the direction of trying to create something that was a a conceptual record Uh, but in the way that me and Ben used to talk about where I think a lot of once he started dominating more of the writing uh, the band sort of moved into these conceptual albums uh, which I really enjoyed so I I had no problem with him taking on the most the the creative energy for that because I really dug what he was doing and that is really apparent in albums like Wiggle and Anthem for New Tomorrow and uh, Emo really all those records in general are sort of all based on a theme a conceptual theme and that's what I was doing with Zeitgeist Echo Um, and a lot of that was based on the the trip that I took after our 2001 show at the House of Blues that triggered my book Weasels in a Box Uh, this sort of knowing that Ben and I were stopping the band and we had done that before but knowing that our relationship had been decaying for quite a while uh, this felt like this might be the real one 
and then being frustrated having to perform a show after only like a week of rehearsal in front of like 2,000, 3,000 people. Um, I was very frustrated, and that's um, and people who have read my book or heard me talk about it, that's where I, me and Ben both sort of went into a tizzy for this lack, last, uh, for the last song of the, of the concert, which I think was a song called Bark Like a Dog, which is from uh, Teen Punks in Heat. It's sort of a ripoff of a Stooges type of song. And uh, that's where I destroyed my guitar, I broke my foot, uh, broke my toe, not my foot, and it sort of uh, sparked this whole idea of of writing uh, an article. It was supposed to be about the Lillingtons and my experience with Ben that night, but it quickly turned into uh, a seven-year project of, of a book, which took me to uh, Europe after the breakup of the band um, to try to get away. You know, sometimes you just need to get away uh, from your state, from your family, from your friends, from your country. And it was it's really, I think, a lot of the things, the direction my life has taken on, um, a lot of it is due to that trip I took where I met the Mangies. I met my friend David Variki in Belgium. I met uh, the Apers. I spent some time in Ireland, which I love and would love to move to. I spent some time in Sicily with uh, Stefanino, who was in the Popsters, and I met Azura and a bunch of other long-lasting friends. And it's where I got most of the work done for Weasels in a Box and also was planted the idea of starting a band. And many of the songs that I ended up writing for the first couple records were based on diary notes that I was just keeping while on the road, not thinking about what I was doing with them. Um, I didn't think I was going to be in a, another band as a main writer. I just, uh, it wasn't really, I thought I was just going to try to transition into just um, being more of a novelist and mostly uh, playwriting. Um, but lo and behold, a lot of those uh, writings became songs, uh, which is Zeitgeist's Echo, a lot of them on there, and this song, Dear Resonance. Uh, which let's get into. If you're interested and you're watching this and you're still listening, so let's let's indulge a little and hopefully it has something to do with maybe what with what you're going through or what seems to be going on in the world at the time. At this time, because this was done in, I wrote it in 2001 or two, 2002. And the record came out in, um, that's a good question. Do I have it written on here? The record came out in September of 2009. So, wow, I held on to that writing for quite a bit before I turned it into a song. It was a long, rambling section of of, of a page or two that I had written while sitting in a bar. Um, it has no rhyme scheme to it. And that sort of, um, I don't know if it was the first one, but I basically, and I've talked to a lot of musicians, they have this sort of two. They have this two, this two ways of writing. Uh, one was to just sit with a guitar and just sing to whatever is coming out on the guitar at that, at that moment, or piano, uh, you know, trying to, create a min uh, trying to create a melody and words that go with it uh, simultaneously. And I've created a couple songs like that, one of which is um, from the first record called If Leaving Were to Be So Easy, which I say basically took the same amount of time to play, same amount of time to write as, as it does to play. <laughs> um, but this is one of the other types of songs where I have this thing that I wrote and I feel like it should be a song. And but I don't want to mess with it so much that it's going to alter it completely, like trying to put rhymes into it. So it's basically trying to create a, a song, put chords underneath something that will make the lyrics stick out instead of distracting from them. And I think it's a really interesting way to write. And the you end up creating your maybe less melodic songs, but to me, they're the ones that last a little bit longer. And... Uh, 
this is one of the songs that people that really know the band that they constantly sort of comment to me about even if they don't know what it means there's something that resonates quote unquote uh, with them about this song and I think it has something to do with that I didn't write it just to be a song it it, it was written uh, about something that I was contemplating at the time that I was trying to figure out um, so now I'll give a little bit of the background uh, on that tour of Europe trying to write Weasels in a Box I stopped in uh, a couple places in Germany because I had taken some German lessons and I got it in my mind that I wanted to speak uh, German because I fell in love in college with a uh, German girl who who uh, read me a German poem one night. I think it was a German translation of the the poem Tiger by by William Blake. Um, but she did it in German, and I was like, "Oh, it's beautiful." And I and once again, I like contradictions because it's not really known <laughs> or thought that the German language is beautiful. But coming from her and the way that she said the poem it made me realize that it can be beautiful. beautiful. So I decided I was going to start learning that. So that's why I went to Germany. Uh, and, and I went to Nuremberg. And one of the, there's two stories I'll tell that lead to the beginning of the writing of this song. One was, um, I'm not really good with, I wish I was just way more external than I am. I'm very private but willing to talk, so it's an interesting way to be. But I would like to just go to a country and walk into a bar and start talking to everybody, learning about everything. But what I do is I pretty much stay alone until someone approaches me. So I went to uh, to this place to have some, uh, some boiled wieners. Um, I was looking it up to try to find the name of these, and I couldn't find them anywhere. But in Nuremberg... I had heard that it was a specialty thing to get this crock pot full of sort of mini wieners, uh, which they serve as sauerkraut, I think. And so I had that. It was delicious. But across from me, I saw this older fellow who was wearing uh, lederhosen. And I got a kick out of him, and he sort of waved at me, and I waved back. And uh, eventually he came over to see. He started talking to me, and... uh, we got along pretty well. We were talking about, he was telling me, me things on that street that we were at because we were on the square in Nuremberg. And uh, then he said, well, why don't I just uh, drive you around and take you to a bunch of different places? And you got to know something about me. I'm not, I didn't know whether he was a gay man and hitting on me. I didn't, I didn't care. Uh, it happened to me at something like that in Sicily too at, at the time. And uh, I just sort of wander into those things without... I mean, luckily, I'm physically enough to take care of myself enough where I'm not too worried about being abducted or beat up. Um, But I also just naturally want to take chances like that because I'm not extrovert enough to make things happen. So if some things cross my path, I usually will go for it. So... (laughs) I, I went on all these, uh, went around town with this guy, and it was great. And I never saw him again. Um, but basically, what I figured out during this, because my history is one of my worst classes, so uh, someone more familiar with history probably would have picked this up earlier. But I realized we went to this one field, and I was like, I think I've seen this in a documentary. And he talked about speeches going on there, and I, I'm being ambiguous for a reason. And then he took me to a couple other places. And then I realized, oh, he's taking me to all the places that had Hitler remembrances or memorials uh, where he gave famous speeches or where the document, there's a famous documentary that he had this uh, female uh, director at the time make. And it was one of her biggest projects. There's a documentary about her. I can't remember her name. But I went to that place, and then I realized, oh, this man is is a child. Uh, he was in the Nazi party when he was a child, so he was probably brought up, to, up into that. And I don't know why. I just never thought to think that that, I don't know. It's always, I don't know. 
you know, politics from another country sometimes are like a dream, even though there's no denying, or some people deny, that the, the Nazi uh, regime happened. But I don't know, it, it, was, it was another world to me. And realize this man was living a normal life for himself, um, but was a part of that. It kind of blew my mind. And then that day, I met a girl, uh, Angelina. And I had been writing another book about a girl called Angelica. So this idea of a woman angel had already been in my mind. So she started talking to me, and I think she... I don't know if she liked... I never really found out if she liked me, liked me. But um, she was a little bit younger, and we hung out all day. And there's something that she said. I wish I could remember it, because it actually was the one that got me... Once she left the bar and I stayed there, it got me starting to write this. But there was something that she said that implied that the weight or the guilt of the Nazi regime... uh, was still weighing heavily on her, even though she was two generations, a couple, maybe more. I mean, I have the 1940. She was, yeah, like three gener, two generations later, two or three generations later. Uh, this weight was still sort of embedded in in who she was, and that may seem obvious, but I think some of the obvious thing, obvious ideas, are ones that you can probably contemplate the longest. That's why I think uh, haikus are so fascinating uh, because they're so short. But you, you know, once you start really digging into the simplicity of it, there's many different thoughts that came out of it. So after when she left, I uh, I wrote this I wrote this long rambling page of notes, and then I I pretty much I cut out a lot of it. I think, but. Um, and I don't have that. I wish I still had that piece of paper, but I don't. So now we will go into the song itself. So that's the background of it. Is that it, it was about me traveling, sort of being lost, uh, without my band of Screeching Weasel, which I've been doing for 20 years. Um, it was about uh, being in an unknown land, being single, uh, being shy, meeting these <laughs> this Nazi child. Uh, and also uh, finding this woman that I that I romantically wanted to be involved with, but was too afraid to do anything about. So this song came along, um, and I named it later. I didn't have any name to the things I was writing when I first wrote it, but when I started even in blackouts and started purposely making this into a song, I came up with "Dear Resonance," which uh, there's a reference to John Lennon in the song. And and also, I had I had a cover of a, a John Lennon or Beatles song that Chris Barrows had done, and I really liked his cover of it. And I was listening to the White Album a lot then too. So the title is from uh, "Dear Prudence." Uh, which is a John Lennon written song for the, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's the White Album. Um, So that was sort of a take on that, Dear Resonance compared to Dear Prudence. Now let's get into these words here. The first line, which repeats a couple times in it, is, "When When I thought of these incidences then, when I thought of all these happenings then, I was thinking of them now. I mean, to me, that's I really like that line because it's kind of being goofy at, at the same time, but also I think fairly uh, uh, I don't know fairly com- fairly complex. Uh, it's you know it's basically double talk, um, and it's stating something ob- that you could say obviously like the things I'm the things I was thinking back then. Back then, I was thinking them now. So that's sort of, it sort of introduces, it's maybe even the hypothesis, introducing this idea that all of what I'm going to be talking about is this idea of looking at things in the past and trying to see them from the perspective of the present 
and also seeing them from what you've learned from them and what you haven't learned from them in the future. Let that sit there for a moment. Uh, so the next line is, it gives resonance those hours I spend contemplating the effects of resonance. That's also to me kind of fun because it's this idea that this song is about resonance and the fact that I'm thinking about resonance takes up my time, which resonates in the future, you know, because whatever you do now is going to affect, you know, what you do in a few moments or what you do in a couple of years. It's all connected. So that's sort of what it's playing with. But it's doing, a, you know, tongue in cheek sort of uh, referencing the, the title of the song, which is the thing that's actually causing the problem. Um, I also thought a lot about this resonance. Uh, maybe this will come up more later, so I'll just touch on it slightly because uh, it has to do with this next line. Okay, I'll just say the next line. <laughs> the next line is, Dear resonance, is the distance real? So there's basically the question I'm asking. And this idea of resonance, because uh, it's it's also a very musical term, as in like you know, the strings resonate. Uh, and I really like this idea of and we and we talk about how things, ideas resonate with you. I'm like that idea resonates me with me, or but and also in terms of how the past affects us. But I really like this idea of that things that happen sort of cause vibrations like music, and sort of exist in the air whether we we are aware of them or not. A lot like the the zeitgeist, like the spirit of the times, is you you can be in touch with these these vibrations that are going on in the air. Um, it, this is sounding kind of hippie, but I, I mean it more in a, I don't know, in an artistic way, in a creative way. Um, so that's it. So I'm basically asking, Dear Resonance, is the distance real? The simple simple way of saying that is, are, am I any different from where, uh, from what I was before? I think that's kind of what I'm asking myself or asking in general. Are we any different from what we were before? Have we learned any lessons? The next line is, uh, there's guilt of the past that is so past that it's still present. That has a lot to do with, that is directly about Angelica, about how I was fascinated by the fact that she felt guilt of generations past. Uh, stuff that happened way before she was born and that she could have done nothing about. I think she had said that her mom was like a sympathizer and was very, was still very racist, so that it was still very alive in her and she was reacting towards her mom. That might have been what she was talking about. Um, but her mom, well, she was younger, so her mom was probably not even, not even born then either because my mom was born in the, 40s I think sort of 30s so this is yeah it's still like she of course I mean it all resonates and <laughs> let me go on I think I got off track there uh, so the next line that uh, it, it is connected with this line I just read so there's guilt of the past that is so past that it's still present um, yeah it's I'm not just saying that we have guilt of the things that we've done still today. You know, that's how guilt works. It's it's not guilt. I mean, guilt about what we do in the future is kind of <laughs> futile. Why worry about that when there's enough guilt in the past? Uh, but this is says, and this is where words are important to me, that so past that it's still present. It's so past, which means it's so it's beyond her own past. It's it's so back there that any lessons we can actually learn from it, from experience, don't exist. So that makes it very present still. Does that make sense? Like, we could intellectualize about lessons to learn about things, but we don't really learn them, in my mind, till you can relate to whatever you're trying to understand in a experiential way. Not that we have to experience everything to know that it's bad. Like you don't need to experience a concentration camps to know that it's horrible that people died and that were that were in the concentration camps. But you have to know, I feel you have to know what pain is in order to relate. 
in some way. So that's basically what it's saying, that things can be so far in the past that we might still have guilt even though we weren't there then, or we might ignore them completely so the the ugliness of the past is still very present. And then it says, uh, in its horridness, which I just said, that's so that's the horrible part of it, in the humor applied to ridicule, um, this is going to foreshadow the, the next verse where I talk about being in the dance club, where it goes to present tense. Um, but this is basically saying that oftentimes, this is my problem with irony often, is that like a lot of the people that were making fun of disco and, do, and listening to disco ironically, you know, when I would watch them do this, this actually happened, you know, in the 90s, I think. And people were like, hey, disco, hey, look at the Bee Gees. Hey. But then you look at them, they're having fun. It's like, you, why don't you just skip that stupid middle step of ego and just like them? I mean, you could have disagreements with them as people or, you know, you can have complexity, you know. It does not just black or white. You don't have to hate it in order to like it. <laughs> so... Uh, that's the same sort of logic I apply to. I apply to this idea that sometimes we you know, we create humor or ridicule things that are closer to us than we would like to think they are, in order to avoid actually dealing with them. Which it says in the next line is to keep what's dreadful in the distance. And I didn't say in the past there. I said distance. So I like playing with this. The present time, you know, distance can play. Uh, within the present moment, you know, it's how far things are away. So I still like that idea of a dissonance and distance uh, and resonance. All those words sort of have this nice sound together. Are you still interested? Uh, so next line is histories of figurines so fresh in the minds of babes who were never witnesses but, but must relive the consequences in the fiber of their day to day. So that's the finishing up of that one verse. And that continues on with what I had uh, experienced from being taken around to all the Hitler memorials to spending an evening with a beautiful girl who was still feeling guilt from things that happened. Fifty years before she was born. Histories of figurines so fresh in the minds of babes. Uh, this one, even though it sounds nicely poetic, I really didn't like uh, how I wrote this. I just couldn't get at what I wanted to say. But let me explain this. So, uh, The fact that I'm explaining a song it either means that, that <laughs> there's no way to figure out that it's too obtuse or that people don't spend the time to look at them. But if you're interested in this, here we go. So histories of figurines. Figurines for me, obviously, figurines meant I was trying to give the image of uh, army figures, like uh, you know, army men and, and the idea of little dolls, you know, small little dolls. So, the, so them taking, taking the place of actual soldiers or actual people I like the idea of talking about that the history is so far back there that they're more like little figurines to us than actual people. Uh, but then it says it's so fresh in the minds of babes who were never witnesses. So that's basically just a poetic way of saying it's it's. I'm surprised it's still in the minds of people who weren't even born uh, while this happened. And uh, then it says, but must relive the consequences in the fiber of their day to day. That's kind of, I think, the crux and the part that I feel is something I try to think about often. I think it's the it's the thing that in the mind that has a question mark that is never supposed to be answered, but is supposed to leave open a room for thoughtfulness. Now, let me try to explain that. So, must relive the consequences. I've had a song 
called Consequences on this record, too. So that idea means a lot to me, too. That's very existential to be talking about consequences. Consequences in the fiber of their day-to-day. Uh, the fiber of their day-to-day, I, to me, it had two meanings. The, the fiber, I always wanted to resonate with this idea of, of veins or, you know, a part of you, uh, which is unlike, it's a contradiction in, with uh, talking about figurines earlier. So it's talking about something that's so past that it's not real, affecting us now and down to like our veins and and the way our blood pumps. Um, And the idea that the fiber of the day to day, that like even a day that has nothing to do with stuff that happened to us in the past, there's still resonance uh, affecting the choices we make. Whew. And so there, let's move on. So that's that sentence. And that's about Angelica, my experiences with Angelica. And then um, it goes back to the course again. When I thought of all these incidences then, when I thought of all these happenings then, I was thinking of them now. Oh, also a little cool thing that I, I did on purpose uh, was I added an extra beat in into the song so that and it really fucks me up when I play it live because I actually have to count every single time I do it but there's uh one extra beat on the second time through on each chorus and that was the, it, it sort of was supposed to be about this resonating that um this reson re, this resonating causes another moment in time basically um, so I wanted it to to feel that way too within the song, within the structure of how we uh, created the rhythm of the song. And the beginning is sort of like that too. It's very abrupt. It's dun dun dun, and uh, Danny uh, Danny Lipman came up with that, and it, I, it might have him doing that might have provoked me to make the link between that and this writing that I had done, and then I wrote the rest of the song uh, based on first hearing that dun dun dun, a really sort of odd very German language, very, I don't know, very not smooth sounding uh, chord progression. Uh, So uh, uh, resonates those hours I spend contemplating the effects of resonance, dear resonance is the distance real. So that's that again. Now, now this is where the song breaks down a bit. And for me, I uh, I did this on purpose because now, I didn't want to come right out and say it, but now we're in the present tense of the song. Like this, the earlier stuff was me contemplating things of the recent past about the far away past. And now with the sort of breakdown of the song, I'm talking about now. I often do that. I did that with the song Umbrella too. I like this, this sort of structure of putting myself in the past and then putting myself in the present. Um, so that happens a lot in my songs. So here it is, this line, talk of war and actions that resemble such. Once again, that's poetics. Talk of war and actions that resemble such. Uh, so it's basically people were talking about war. I think this, I can't remember what was going on in the world. We had just invaded some other Uh, so talk of war and actions that resemble such like I said that's really almost too poetic but it's basically uh, if you're not talking about war you're talking about violence so uh, they resemble We're talking about things that resemble war which is hate violence aggression uh, talk of war and actions that resemble such and I dance in my club with the guilt of my apathy Shaking this indifference. That's so purposely way, way too sort of... (laughs) I I say intellectual, but it's kind of pseudo-intellectual. Where it almost borders on not making sense that I can actually clarify, but it sounded nice. Uh, So the guilt of uh, the club with the... So I'm in this dance club. And some, uh, we had just invaded, America had just invaded somewhere. Uh, so that's setting, it's sort of setting the situation. Uh, and 
my club with the guilt of my apathy shaking this indifference. I so, see if you're indifference, you can't have guilt. I think that's where the logic sort of fails, or to me, I, I feel like it fails. But I thought it was a fun sort of contradiction. Uh, so basically, it's saying I don't feel like I do. I'm not proactive enough in the discussion of government and politics in order to make any kind of real difference. But that's always been sort of a thing in my life where I feel it's more important to try to make a social difference. Um, and I don't even do that. Like, I feel like I owe, I owe so much time to like helping some sort of cause. <laughs> maybe when I'm 55, I will do that. But I try to hold on to the fact that maybe some of the things from the bands that I've done or some of the plays that I've done that I've created conversation that keeps the world moving or keeps people engaged. And then that is a contribution to the world instead of just creating entertainment. I guess that's important to me. And that's why the song was important. Um, so there I am sitting in this club, numbed to war. I love dancing. So dancing is my way to get break free of this. And maybe I'm feeling the guilt of not really doing anything in my life to uh, have an opinion about what our country is doing and what's right, and what's wrong. Uh, and also, it's uh, oh, what's good to remember too is that because this has to do with it is when I was on that trip to Europe is also when nine eleven happened. So that I forgot that this actually had something to do with this too. Is that I didn't really experience nine eleven the way all of my family and friends experienced it in America. I was not here. So I was in Italy where people were torn apart, but all these, I only experienced one of them, but I heard they were all over that these communities sort of gathered together when they found out and they discussed the issue. And I couldn't understand Italian. So I was in the middle of this happening uh, when I was in, uh, where were we in? Sarzana or La Spezia, one of the two. I was with the Mangies. And there was just passionate arguing going on and crying and people, I heard cursing the Americans and people cursing, uh, cursing the you know, Iraq and whoever they thought, you know, had done this at the time. And, and it was sort of mind blowing. And then I knew it was like, oh my God, I'm, I'm experiencing this on the outside where people back in America are in the thick of it at that moment. Um, so that sort of affected the writing of this too. So I'm sitting in this club a couple years later um, when we engage, we're still engaged in this uh, war that was based on the 9-11. Ah, yes, there it is. See, I should know more about our own history, but that's basically it. We're still engaged in this war based on what happened to us in, at 9-11 uh, and me not understanding enough about politics to know, are we attacking the right people? Uh, fans of the band are going to have to go off to war. And I, I with even a blackouts, I started meeting a couple of these people that uh, were in the, the services. So there I am sitting in the club experiencing this. And then, and then this is just literal. And then I hear Lennon's Imagine. And I like... I wasn't the first one to do this. I think uh, in, in is it in, um, it might be in Don McLean's American Pie where he talks about Lenin and Marx. Yeah, I think so. So this is sort of a uh, reflection on that idea too. That's another thing about the song is I was purposely taking elements from history of music and stuff that to you, to, place in this song to give that feeling of 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 borrowing history or things still resonating and affecting each other so that was that might be the first one of me bringing in Lennon uh, and his song Imagine was playing in the dance club so as I wrote and then I hear Lennon's Imagine and the generations around me waltz in mockery and irony uh, once again it's sort of that idea of ridicule things. So basically what happened is I, at this moment, broke through my apathy and felt the weight of war removed from it because I've never been in war and 
the death of when John Lennon died back then was devastating when I was a child. And I'm putting on this, and the the DJ is playing Imagine uh, for a serious reason, but then all of these people in the club drinking, you know, hitting on each other and, you know, whatever, just being, just entertaining themselves, which is fine. But it really was contrary to the seriousness of the issue to me and the seriousness of the song. Uh, and I got really angry. So I basically said, and the generations waltz, waltzing around me in mockery because a lot of people were uh, gothic dancing to it, trying laughing, and and it really kind of pissed me off. I was in a soft spot at the time. Uh, and then I end by saying, I want some distance. And I like the way that Liz says it on the record. She gives it that power behind it that I wanted. Um, so, and it's sort of, what's funny, it's supposed to be both funny and heartbreaking at the same time, this thing, I want some distance. Because this whole song is talking about how distance doesn't really exist. So for me to yell out, I want some distance, is sort of trying to be, trying to break out of logic or reason and saying, I don't give a fuck what what I rationally think. I emotionally want to be nowhere near this, nowhere near these thoughts, nowhere near these people, nowhere near the situation. So that was that. Um, and then um, this is where the song sort of changes once again. And I'm sort of reflecting on this now. It says, it hurts to know history's closeness can blow a hole right through your bile without showing its face. So I don't always like to do this, but it's poetic enough where it doesn't hit you over the head with it, but that basically says what all of this is about. It just really pains me. It's emotional to feel, to to, to try to understand history and realize that it's all right there now, that everything that's happened is still touching us now, and that we don't cherish history enough to make deep enough changes that will change the world enough. Uh, and that's why I said closeness can blow a hole right through your bile. Now, I, I chose this weird to throw bile in there uh, for a reason. I didn't want, I was going to do like a hole right through your heart, a hole right through your body. But I wanted to be more than the stark image of someone in a war getting shot and killed. I wanted it to be through your bile, which is known as one of the, what is it, one of the seven, seven, ah, that's another one I forget, the seven somethings of the body. It's like an old alchemy thing where the bile is one of, I think, of anger and greed, I think. So I wanted that sort of to resonate, that you've been shot through your bile, so shot through your anger and your greed, um, and without showing its face. Once again, like experiencing uh, my friend Angelica and knowing that she was dealing with this shit that w happened when she wasn't even alive. And, you know, in, in America, we think we're not dealing with that too, but we are. And I think a lot of that is coming to head right now. I think this... This new generation is trying to force us all to uh, face it more, but I hope they do it with leniency because we are the products of our time and uh, we all need to learn lessons on our own time um, as best we can. Uh, and then it ends with the times may be constantly changing Bob. So that's another reference to Bob Dylan saying, you know, the song, the times are a changing. And as another side note, there's a there's a song that references Bob Dylan uh, by a band called uh, Jesus Jones. And I had a friend, an artist who was a big, huge Dylan fan. And he was offended that that Jesus Jones would even reference Bob Dylan. And I thought it was funny that he didn't even really know what the song was about. He was just offended that this pop band was referencing Dylan. So and that's sort of fit in with this idea of what I'm talking about, like how we can get upset or ridicule something we don't understand. Uh, that was sort of a, a joke to myself.
itself. I didn't think anybody would get it, but uh, that's why I threw a reference to Bob Dylan in there because I'm basically doing the same thing him. But it also makes sense because I'm asking Bob Dylan. He wrote a song about the times they are changing, um, which I don't disagree with, but this whole concept of, of resonance that sort of took me over is like, well, what changes are real if all of these vibrations of the past are still out there that we're ignoring or that you just can't do anything about from the way you're brought up? What do we do about that, Bob? <laughs> you know, it's like, does that change? Uh, so that was sort of the question. Uh, and I, then it says, but what does this mean to resonance? That's actually, I mean, I just, I just basically said to you what, the, what I'm still asking here. Dear resonance, is the, is the distance real? That brings it home. I'm asking you, do things change? Do we learn our lessons? How do we, how do we get away from these resonances? Or how do we come to terms with all of this, um, of being part of history and being responsible for our actions? You know, the old Spider-Man, you know, with great responsibility comes with great this guy flash thompson he probably deserved what happened but just because you can beat him up doesn't give you the right to remember with great power comes great responsibility with great responsibility comes great i can't remember you know that one i don't even have to go there so let's bring it home but what does it all mean when everything, 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 and once again, not once again, but so you know, I don't, even in songs, I don't repeat something unless it has some sort of meaning to repeat something. Um, and that was the idea. So it's everything, everything, everything. That's resonances. I was trying to get this idea of everything on top of everything, on top of everything, like everything resonates over the years and years and years and years and years. Uh, what the, but what does it all mean when everything, 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 and all the particles in between? I just wanted to touch on it being science in that moment. Just, I don't know, I could just make it sound more of like a science project or, or, uh, or a hypothesis or a theory. Um, when everything, particles in between, become a long time ago. Uh, and that one really fits with how the music ends because the music sort of builds up and builds up and builds up its attention and then it just drops into that last line with one guitar. Um, so it's more, I think, of an emotional effect than, than the lines meaning uh, quite, a lo quite a lot. The, the, those lines are more simple not as complex as the rest of the song and that's more about where the emotion of the song takes over because it's basically stating the same thing that all these particles everything are all around all the time uh, and when when does a moment become a long time ago uh, that's the question I was asking there um, so thank you I got through it, and I don't know how many of you are going to like that, but it's an important song to me, and I think it sort of shows that when I write a song, I try to do, uh, I try to really give a reason to write it. <laughs> I don't write lightly. Thank you, and goodbye.